less stress, more time, more money. Welcome to the Cash Flow Contractor. Deep dive. Martin, you stressed out? I'm stressed, man. You got you got no time? I'm gonna go watch my uh, Cheech and Chong movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. More free time, less stress, man. Yeah. You got you running more money. Yeah. Running out of money. Running out of money. No cash flow. Not running out of money. Not not a problem with cash flow. Life is good. Well, thanks for joining us because we're talking about things that are gonna help you have less stress, more time, more money. You thanking me for joining you? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I'm Are you sure getting I'll tired be. of this yet? We're this is no. It's, today. This is this podcast stuff is a blast. You were after me to do it. My son's been after me to do it, and it's it's a blast. Well, I've and we hope too. hopefully it's useful. Be I think a it lot is. more of fun if we know that people are benefiting. Yeah. If if you're if you're listening and you've gotten to this point this far, maybe this is your first episode. Maybe this is I don't know what episode number, but definitely in the 30s at this point. Uh, at for this episode, at least, maybe 40s. But uh, what is it? 38. 38. Episode 38, oh. technically, is what this one is. I have no idea. This is launching in January. Yep. Yeah, so this is January. We're recording this in November. If you're still listening, uh, just send us an email or something so we know that you're listening. That would be right. really Criticism, beautiful. praise, either anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Any attention is good attention, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, Building a best work, uh, best place to work is our topic, Martin. Have you ever worked at, at a bad workplace? I have. I've been the CEO of a bad workplace. Seriously. What's that like? It's terrible. Um, it's, uh, well, we won't go into all of it, but uh, I literally have been responsible for a bad workplace. Mm. By uh, I, I inherited a bad place, but I didn't make it much better. And, and, and it was a big learning experience. Why not? Just because you didn't know or because you weren't aware or because it was hard? There's an old Chinese saying, he who hesitates is lost. And I hesitated and equivocated. Uh, We're not talking about it today, but it's been a subject with a lot of my clients recently is letting people go and making changes that you know you need to make. Yeah. And I didn't make those changes because I had all the standard excuses of, oh, maybe I haven't given them a chance. Maybe I didn't train them well enough. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a little bit, if I admitted, of, well, if I get rid of them, I'm going to have to replace them, and I don't know where that's going to come from. Yeah. All the standard excuses. Uh, but the benefit of not doing that was to see how horrible things can be. Nobody was killed. It wasn't that <laughs> horrible. But it was miserable. Yeah. Uh, going to work with a bad work environment was miserable for me. And also for all the people who work for me. For sure. Not all of them. Some of them were pretty good. Mm. Well, I'm excited to talk about this because I think that um, so often as as business owners and for contractors, we get we can get so focused on the work itself. And we can get so focused on the next sale and the next project that we don't take a step back to realize what we're actually building with our business. And, um, you know, I think when we talk about things like a best place to work it sounds real fluffy it sounds like something that these large corporations may talk about I know for me a big example is um, you know I've got a lot of friends that work out in Silicon Valley the Bay Area and it's so interesting to see everything that they provide their employees and I don't know if anybody's seen the internship it's a movie with I think Vince Vaughn and Owen, Owen Wilson where they are interns at Google and it's a really funny movie I, I encourage people to watch it um but their culture, their work environment is, you know, they've got bikes on campus that you can use for free to go around from building to building. And they've got a all you can eat cafeteria that is open 24 seven and, you know, coffee shops with free coffee inside. And they've got nap pods uh, and foosball tables, ping pong tables, video game arcades, you know, all these different things that essentially make it to where you don't want to leave. And I think that's intentional by Google and a lot of these places is that they, when they hire you, they expect you to live there and that's your, that's your life. Right. They're bribing but, you in effect. Exactly. But at the same time, um, those things aren't what really matter 
at least from my perspective, if I were to work somewhere, those aren't really the things that truly matter. Those are, you know, amenities, if you will. And I think on a psychological level, there's things that are much more important. And so I'm excited to talk about those things today. Um, great tip. Most of, most of our, uh, I'm sorry? No, go ahead. go ahead. Well, I think most of our contractor listeners aren't going to provide bikes and sleep pods to uh, oh, their no employees way. either. No way. Um, uh, yeah, it doesn't really apply, you know? And so then they think about best place to work. Oh, well, that's out the window. That's not what I'm worried about. But it is an important thing. So um, I wanted to reference, I think it's a TED Talk that you're mentioning. Maybe it's a book as well that I'm unaware of, but by Daniel Pink. Um, yeah, He's a got a that. book called Drive, and it's okay. really good. And it's uh, Employment V2 or something like that is in version 2, but the new world. I'm not sure it's all that new, but... He describes the things that matter to everybody, and particularly employees, as autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Mm -hmm. That's what people want. Uh, we can go into a little bit of them, but autonomy means people want to uh, be autonomous. They're not machines. I was telling you a story before we went on the air that um, General Motors used to have assembly line jobs in Oklahoma, and they paid about two and a half times the per capita mean average wage in Oklahoma. Wow. And it seemed like that's kind of ridiculous. That's an unskilled job. It's not unskilled, but it's not a college education, high degree kind of job. But one of the reasons was, if you were working on the line at General Motors, you were essentially a part of the machine. <laughs> you were not thinking for yourself because here came the next car. And if you're putting a brake shoes on, you got to get them on and you got seven seconds before it moves on. So you did not have autonomy. Mm. Uh, the second thing that he talks about mastery, and we can develop it some more, but mastery means that people want something they can get better at. Yeah. Uh, so you give them a job that has an appropriate level of challenge in it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take somebody who's just out of high school, started working as a laborer, and give them physics problems to work as part of their jobs. That might be a, a bridge too far. But something appropriate. I can learn to do this, and mm -hmm. when I get that down, I can learn to do that and, and grow. And by the way, that never, ever, ever stops uh, for most people anyway. And the last one is purpose. So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And that answers, why am I doing this? Yeah. And we'll talk about that. There are some really significant whys, huge, big whys. But for the people driving around thinking, well, I wonder what my why is. Uh, the why of the people working for you may not be your why. You might just want a why. So you can buy a vacation condo at a ski resort. Mm -hmm. That's not going <laughs> to inspire somebody. No. But one why that's always there, or can always be there, is to not let down your team. Yeah. If you're part of a group, I want to. That's that's human nature thing. Right. So that's always a why. But if a if a uh, an employer can find autonomy, mastery, and why uh, purpose yeah. and purpose. Yeah, the purpose and provide that for people, you're well down the road to building a great workplace. Absolutely, and you notice you're not gonna see nap pods or cafeterias or whatever inside any of those. Um, I think uh, to just dive into each of those just a little bit more, I think on an autonomy level, I guess it can be hard for contractors to think about that. You know, They don't necessarily want a technician or somebody um, that's just going out to a house to have complete autonomy over their business but that's not really what we're saying like in their role do they have the opportunity to be creative do they have the opportunity to dictate their schedule a little bit uh, maybe spend a little bit extra time with the homeowner or to, to um, you know get on the job site a little bit early and do some prep work and maybe lead the team you know uh, there's just a lot of different ways that, that can happen yeah assigning responsibility to somebody an appropriate level of responsibility so that if they blow it, they don't ruin your business. Exactly. But it uh, goes into mastery and purpose too, but it's a sign of respect Yeah. That, that you respect them as people and that you're willing to give them this chance. Yeah. Hopefully they step up and pull it off. And I think, well, I think even on a, like an easier level, like you, like just even backing up, a lot of people, they hire someone and then they, just completely micromanage them. Right. And that's really bad 
for a best place to work. No one wants to be micromanaged. That's the opposite of autonomy. Exactly. And so that's your even you're the machine again on the assembly line. Yeah, exactly. Even if you just provide clear expectations of what you're looking for to them and what their role entails, and then letting them do that the best way they can, that's a really great way of giving autonomy where, hey, I want this to be done like this, or you know, here's the systems we have. Now let's let I'll let you implement it. Right. Yeah, you know, that brings to mind, my father was a successful manufacturer back in the 70s, and he had the Giraffe of the Week Award. Mm-hmm. And it was, he had a saying, and it was, when in doubt, stick your neck out, but then come tell me what you did. And when in doubt, in other words, don't come running and ask, make a decision, take an action, yes, yes. but then come tell me what you did so that we can look at it and adjust it and make it right. But that's what he was trying to build, his autonomy. He wanted to hire people's brains, mm. not just a body that does some routine functional thing. Yeah. So a giraffe of the, of the week or a giraffe of the month award is a, is a great way to go about it and reward people. I mean, they literally gave him a little stuffed giraffe. Oh, nice. And people got really excited to get one, but also right. they learned mm-hmm. in the effort, to, and it set the attitude that he had towards, toward people. It was a big success. That's great. I, I love that. And uh, going back to manufacturing, I think that's really a, a industry where if you do have that brain rather than just that heartbeat, if you will, um, it really makes a big difference. I know that we've both read Two Second Lean by Paul right. Akers, another great book for anyone to read, not just manufacturers. Um, it's not just about the business owner having a, a lean uh, manufacturing perspective. It's literally about everybody on the team looking for small improvements all right. the time, uh, and if you if you give autonomy to those to people, they're gonna think of things that you never thought of. They're gonna improve your business in ways that you can't, because you don't have the time, because you're not you know the boots on the ground, whatever it is. At, at any rate, it's a force multiplier. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I think autonomy is a big one, and giving people, you know. For, it, it, it varies from job to job, from contractor to contractor, from business to business, but desirable schedule, clear expectations, ability to make decisions, asking for forgiveness, not permission a lot of times, things like that. Mm-hmm. So um, talking about mastery a little bit more, I think a big one for, for me with mastery is I've, I've been in some jobs in the past, even just you know as a, a high school student, where the work just wasn't challenging. Um, and it could have been the nature of the work itself, but it was probably also how I was managed is I wasn't trusted. Once I learned something, it's like they just wanted me to stay in that one spot and there was never an opportunity to grow and to be promoted or to be given new little tasks that were more challenging. And I think that's a big one is no one wants to sit there and just do the mundane, like your example of the the GM plant. I mean, it, it gets dull, you know? Um, but yeah, I think having challenging work is a really important thing. Have you have you seen any examples of that? Challenging work, yeah. Uh, podcasting and business coaching, <laughs> <laughs> but I think mastery is not possible. No, um, I mean just maybe not in a big picture of challenging, but literally, if you start working somewhere on a crew and you start out on the shovel, yeah, and then you want to drive the skids there. Right, mm-hmm. then you get off the SID steer and you get to drive the, the uh, you get good with a true track hoe, and maybe yeah. the bulldozer. And there's pride in being able to do all those things. And yep. those are kind of concrete, visible ways to move up, but they take responsibility with them. Yeah. And you start out as a laborer or low man on the totem pole and work your way up to maybe you're a foreman for a crew. Yeah. And those kind of things are uh, what give you meaning which is not really what we're on yet but they're the kind of things that you are growing you're not just stuck in one place down on yourself because you're producing more you're helping more you're helping your company you're yeah. helping your customer and you start to begin to get purpose absolutely and I think something that is also a part of mastery and that I don't know that people give enough opportunities for is the opportunity to manage somebody else Right. There's the, you give someone a role and you say, okay, get good at this, and they get good at it, but maybe you don't let them go cross-functional and go into different roles, but you also don't really give them the opportunity to maybe train someone. 
And it doesn't even have to be about that task that they're doing. Like right now, for example, at um, our agency, I know we're not a contractor, but we have something that we're doing called Benali Guides. We've got these new hires, right? And rather than me be the only person that's spending time with that new hire, I've taken some employees and said, hey, I want you to be their guide. Just be there, talk to them once or twice a week outside of work or outside of normal work uh, settings. And just reach out to them and ask how they're doing. Maybe read a book with them that's out, outside of this, but be their guide. And that's something where, wow, this is a little bit challenging and I'm getting to help someone. And I am a master of Benali. I'm a master of that company. I have more tenure. I get to lead someone as they start here, you know, and they get more invested in it. And it, it really becomes something where not only is the new hire nurtured better, and I don't have to take, you know, my time to, you know, just spend all this time with a new hire, but our team is really invested in the new hire as well. So that's just an example that I think is really easy for a lot of contractors. Like set up that precedent. You've got a, you've got a crew of 20 or whatever. Every time you add someone new, make sure they have somebody that's there to lead them through your culture, through right. what your company is like. And kind of it makes your organization follow the same three areas. As an organization, your organization has autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Mm -hmm. And everybody within that is paralleling the whole organization. Absolutely. I think you, I think another thing, um, as you get into mastery, you also have to almost help people become a master. So you have to invest in them. If they're a good person, you invest in them with professional development. Hey, I'm going to send you to this conference. Hey, I, I'm going to give this, you, give you this course or this training so that you're certified or you're able to do this new role, this new task. If you're doing, if you're showing in that level of investment, they're going to return that investment to right. you, you know? And I think, I think another thing to think about is coaching your employees, not always directing them. If you're asking them more questions and saying, ra rather than, hey, I need you to do this. Hey, what do you think we could be doing next? Right. Right? Yeah, absolutely. How, how do you think we should do that? How would you do that? What ideas do you have? Those kinds of questions, rather than saying, hey, I need you to do that really go a long way because it shows trust in the person and it shows they, that they, you're willing self -reliant to too. They become more self-reliant. They've learned to make a decision. Which is better for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point of that giraffe idea was. Exactly. Come on, make a decision. Yeah, absolutely. We need you. We need, we need you to, to show that there. I think another thing is always giving a promotional plan to people is really helpful. Showing them, hey, if you can do X, Y, Z in this period of time, then we might move you to, we'll, we'll do our best to move you to this next position, you know, if things pan out the way we plan to. Uh, showing people how they can go from like a level one employee to a level two or level three and mapping those things out with them really sh gives them something to look forward to, something to strive for, uh, to show them that they're on that path to mastery. Yeah, and we talk about the last thing being purpose. Why? So autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Um, the purpose gives people a why, okay? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's important to that is a vision. We talk about vision all the time. People might be tired of hearing it, but it's still the number one. What are we doing and why are we doing it? Yeah. The reason I bring that up now is when you're talking about coaching your employees, one thing that's really fun is to talk to your employees about what their vision is Absolutely. for their lives. And you may not be surprised, I have been, that people don't have one. Uh, trapped by their own mindset, mm -hmm. I think, well, I'm just a laborer. It, not everybody thinks that way, but whatever the just is, I'm yeah. just a, I'm just a $20 an hour guy that might go to 25. I'm just a $25 an hour guy that might get to 75,000, but everybody sets those limits. And if you're working with people and show engagement mm -hmm. and can get somebody to buy into a vision, you will get their energy if you can align the company goals with their goals to achieve that vision. Yeah. And it's, it's huge and it doesn't happen very often. Absolutely. I think um, the most difficult question, and I think Ethan would attest to it, to this, uh, that I ask my employees is what do you want? Right. And it has been a wow. challenge and they're, they That's literally like, why, why are you asking me this? Like, no, like, what do you want? And I, I, People can get really uncomfortable and even hostile, just so listeners know that. Yeah. Because it, it's touching a nerve. 
It is they feel thing. like, well, I'm no, I'm no good. I don't even know what I want. Well, that's pretty common. And <laughs> For anybody. It should be treated that way and said that's normal, but let's think about what you want and then help coach them through that. Yeah. I think also as an owner, um, you're really in a unique position. Like, it matters to build a best place to work because your employees are literally spending a majority of some of the best years of their life, life. Yeah. with you. And you have an opportunity as an owner to invest in them not only as a professional, but also as a person. Right. Make it worth their while. Absolutely. Not just money. And the feeling that you get when you get to help someone achieve what they want, their vision, their dreams, surpasses, for me, and I know it's different for everybody, but surpasses all the other feelings of, we just got that new client. Or, right. you know, we, we achieved this milestone of this much revenue or, you know, this much profit, whatever. Because you can see the impact in their life. You can see how you th- how they started and how they ended. Right. And so... I, I think as you build this blessed place to work, recognize that you are impacting lives, not just your employees' lives, but their families' lives. And it's Richard Branson says, I think it was Richard Branson, but we'll go with that. He said, don't worry about your customers. Take care of your employees. They'll take care of the customers. Mm-hmm. And that's part of it. So there's there's payback. That may not be the reason that you're being good to your employees, exactly. but it's also the payback. One of the, it's another kind of payback. Yeah, self-satisfaction, but your company will work better too. Absolutely. I think uh, as we talk about the purpose, you know, Simon Sinek, you, you mentioned why, as he wrote the book, Start With Why. Excellent book if you haven't read it. But people buy what, why you do something, not what you do. Um, I think the same is actually true of employees. And it, yes, people can work for you because of what you do. But those are temporary employees, in my opinion. Those are people that aren't invested in the company culture. They're not planning to stick around in a long time. They're usually not good fits. But the people that work for you because of why you do it, they have a different level of investment into your company, a different level of satisfaction in their life, and the way that they approach their work is completely different because there's so much meaning there. And so just know just as much as you're trying to maybe coach your employees and ask, hey, what do you want? Um, You need to know what you want. If you have to have a clear vision for your future, for what your company is going to do, because if you can then communicate that vision clearly, people will want to jump on board. Uh, And there's so many examples of companies that we're going to give a little bit later that have done a very good job of that. So um, I think there's some extras that kind of fall outside maybe or are a little bit hard to fit into those three areas of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And I think, you know, some that stick out to me are, you know, people want to work in a place where they feel safe, where they're not going to be criticized uh, so heavily that they are crying and want to go home, where they aren't worried about, like, you know, the roof collapsing on them, obviously, right? But just a place where they feel trusted, where they feel like they can be themselves, and they don't have to hide anything, right? Um, they also want to be in a place where there's a respectful culture. Um, you've got a good question that you ask people whenever you do alignments about describing the characteristics. Oh, yeah. I, I have a question when I do team alignments. <clears throat> One is describe the best coworker you've ever worked with anywhere. The other one is describe the worst mm-hmm. coworker you've worked with anywhere. And I almost don't need to change the slides. It's just almost the same, always the same thing. What, what people value in their coworkers are people who are willing to help, who are committed to growth, who are reliable, uh, adaptable, engaged. They're problem solvers. They're constantly wanting to learn. They value creative, creativity and they empower other people. I mean, I see those all the time. When I ask what people to describe the worst coworker they've ever worked with, what they don't value. I hear these things all the time. They do not value people who are selfish, drama driven, full of drama, always going on, uh, who are condescending, negative, who are full of blame and excuses. They're not proactive, they're not engaged, they're inflexible, they're complacent and they're know-it-alls. And by the way, having just split those two, I frequently talk to business owners to describe an ideal employee. Uh-huh. Lots of different industries here. They come up with that same list. 
people who are willing to help, who are engaged, <laughs> they're committed to grow, they're reliable, they're adaptable, they're problem solvers, they're constantly learning, they value creativity, they help their coworkers. Yep. And I always ask them, I say, guys or gals, is that it? You know, they might add a few more. And I said, do you realize that none of you even mentioned good truck driver, good <laughs> carpenter, you know, good concrete person, good accountant. Nobody ever brings that up. Nope. They always mention these things. Absolutely. But then they go and they try to hire somebody. And, and what do they look for? They're looking Can for you the drive a truck? Yeah. 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 That's I think so that's, interesting. That's, that's the key. And yeah. I'm not um, being condescending to anybody listening because that's sure as heck how I did it too. Yeah. Kind of, I need somebody, I'm going to hire somebody that that person can do the job bring them in and I've had some real blow ups mm -hmm. as a result mm -hmm. of hiring for the wrong purpose. I think what's also interesting, you know, we've gone through all these areas and we've talked about what to, how to build that best, you know, workplace. And we haven't mentioned anything about having desirable salaries and desirable benefits. Right. And yes, those things matter just like skills. Oh, matter. money, money always. I mean, I, I don't want to be too specific because it's been a while since I've seen it, but money always ranks fifth, sixth, stuff like that for mm -hmm. motivator. And if you ask somebody, they'll say they're after the money, but they won't quit, quit a job where they love their coworkers, where they're respected, where they understand what's expected of them, when, when they know what to do. They're not gonna quit that. Now, if somebody comes along with double the money, they might think about it and right. then learn to regret it, but they're not going to because they don't, they just consistently, there needs to be enough money that they can live it, well, somebody described it. Pay them enough money that you take money off the table as a factor. Exactly. But don't hire them because you're the highest pay in the, in the county. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. And same thing with benefits. Like benefits matter. You know, all these things like health insurance and dental, vision, 401k, retirement. Um, uh, what am I missing? Anything else? Yeah. yeah. No. You know, like health care and retirement. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll, you might see time off. You, yeah, of course, time off. Um, you'll see um, gym membership or phone bill or something like that. But those things matter, but not nearly as much. And I think sometimes what, what business owners run into and contractors run into is they, they think that they've just got to worry about the salary and the benefits. And so they just throw numbers out there and you know throw all these things together. And they don't even think about all the other things that actually matter. Um, that really make it. That's a, that's a really good point. That's a lot like pricing, exactly. Because that's like what you're pricing. doing. Uh, well, I got to be the low price. Yep. Well, not if you give them reasons other than price to buy from you. And when you're dealing with uh, when you're dealing with uh, hiring people, you also have to give them a reason mm -hmm. other than money to buy from you. Uh, to to come work from you. Right. Right. Yeah, you, you do. Um, it's it's not as simple as just, okay, let's put a price on this role and let's say what our benefits are and let's put the job description right. out there and then go hire. I mean, that is not how it should be. Well, I know absolutely that some people are listening to us going, yeah, you're living in la-la land. <laughs> um, I got to have people and I got to have them today. Everybody goes through that, but you at least begin to accumulate uh, people who want to work for you for the right reasons. Yeah. You're going to have to run through some who are working for you for the wrong reason, but you find the good ones and you accumulate them. Yep. But you have to have the environment that the good ones will stick. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. Um, you know, just, I've got three pretty basic questions that I want us to answer about, you know, what does it mean to be a best place to work? Why is it worth it to build it? And how do you actually go do it? We've kind of touched on these a little bit from now, but let's get really specific. Like, what does it actually mean to be a best place to work? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just gave you my history. <laughs> well, we can come up with different kinds of definitions, but I guess kind of an overarching easy one is it's a place where people, qualified people, want to come to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorite words in that is engaged. Engaged can mean a lot of things, but it means people are seeking to solve problems. Uh, they're not clock watchers. Uh, they're interested in what's going on, 
What are the goals? Are we moving towards our vision? Uh, are we keeping, if a customer's unhappy, it affects them. Uh, it's not just, eh, just another, another customer. Yeah. Uh, so that's a pretty short example, but it's a, it's a place where people want to come to work. Yeah. And that encompasses all, all of those things. I mean, for me, like, I just try to put myself in my employee's shoes. Like, is this a place where I'd be happy to wake up and give some of the best hour, hours of my day to? I mean, just simply answering that question for myself really dictates a lot of the decisions I make for my company. And I think contractors need to take that perspective as well. Like, if, if you're building a, a workplace and you can't answer that question honestly that, yes, if I was an employee at this business, I would stick around, then right. your, your employees are not going to be able to answer that either. We have something a little bit specific um, from a lady named Christine Sexter. Yeah. And she provided this with permission, and we'll also have her on the show here, but it's a great list. She divides things up into motivators and demotivators. And a best place to work is going to have a lot of motivators yeah. and very few demotivators. And you, you kind of have a, an idea of what all those are, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put a list of these in the show notes, uh, and we're, we're going to probably walk through all of them pretty in depth with Christine when she comes on. But, you know, some easy demotivators uh, are being taken for granted, which I see all the time, um, that there's always constant change without communication. Uh, there's dishonesty, distrust. There's a lack of follow-up. The leadership is really intimidating and uses a lot of threatening language. Um, that the leaders aren't actual role models. They're hypocritical. They ask for one thing, but don't do it I themselves. Um, that they micromanage. We already mentioned that. Um, they, you know, ha they talk about a lot of things that people don't like talking about, like politics. Right. Right. Um, the the poor quality in their work is actually tolerated. Um, it's sometimes even encouraged. Or, or they they see poor quality in other people's works. Yep. And nothing happens. There are yep. no consequences. Absolutely, no consequences is a big one. It all pays the same. That's what. Yeah. Guys, you said it all pays the same. Yeah, just tolerating poor performance in general and frequent uh, poor performance, unclear expectations, just unnecessary rules that keep them from, you know, doing their job. Yeah, you, know, you you just hit on one that is in my mind without statistics, but I believe it to be true from experience. Number one demotivator is unclear expectations, and that manifests itself in a lot of ways. Where you tell somebody to do something one way, someone the next day. You come out and say, what'd you do that for? We well, told me, don't give me that stuff. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know how they're supposed to do it, and they don't know how they're going to be measured. Yeah. Another way unclear expectations show up is office politics. Mm -hmm. So if you and your partner are at odds, people who are just trying to come have autonomy, mastery, and purpose and work at your business, now they've got to choose. Am I a Khalil guy or a Martin guy? Mm -hmm. And they don't want that, but... That's unclear because it's unclear who's going to win. So that's that's probably a core reason that politics yeah. in an office or in a company doesn't have to be in the office are so are so damaging yeah. because people working for it they're just trying to make a living they don't really want to participate. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's a big one. Unclear expectations. Absolutely. I think um, you know those these those are a lot of demotivators and honestly, I think a lot of contractors are probably listening to this and. You know, one probably being hypercritical of themselves, because it's really easy or to look us. at this or <laughs> us. But it's really easy to look to look at to hear some of these things and be like, oh, well, there's that one time that this happened or whatever. There's going to be demotivators, right? There's th some stuff is going to happen on here. Like there's going to be a time where you didn't follow up on that thing, or you said you were going to do this and you didn't do it. It happens, and people make mistakes, and your employees recognize that. It's not about having no demotivators. Right, it's you just working to reduce them. You just you have to consciously take an effort to decrease the demotivators right. that you have inside your workplace. Which begins with being aware of them. Which begins exactly. with downloading that document from our yeah show notes. Absolutely, put take the list and put it. Test yourself. Yeah. Look at your company. Look, get with your trusted your partner or your mm -hmm. senior people, or and say, hey, how do we rank on this? Check yeah. box the ones that we have. Now, what are some of the good attributes, the motivators? 
Yeah. And I mean, it's, I think it's common sense when you hear these, but you know, appreciation, if you show appreciation for your employees that you give them challenges, uh, and good challenges, challenges where you trust them, not where you're challenging who they are. That's the mastery. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you're giving them choice. You're giving them options. Uh, you're encouraging them. You're having fun and you're happy, uh, that you give them goals, uh, that you give them input. I'd ne- I don't, I really see a big lack of this is giving quarterly reviews, for example, or even annual reviews. Um, but input and giving your opinion and asking for their opinion uh, is a big one too. Giving them leadership opportunities. We kind of talked about that a little bit earlier, that you give them opportunities to learn and have professional development. Um, you know, fair pay uh, that is above, or that is at or at above industry average. Um, just that you give them recognition and respect that you trust them with responsibility, um, that you have a tolerance for some errors. Uh, but for the most part, these are really easy things to do if you're intentional and aware of them. But they're also really things, really easy things to avoid and not do if you're not aware of them and you're just trying to run your business and you're just trying to get the next sale, you're just trying to make sure the project's done, you can really you know, easily sometimes they're, avoid these. They're hard... Also, when a trusted employee or a valuable employee leaves mm. because of whatever, husband or wife transfers, mm-hmm. have to just whatever, and sometimes you feel betrayed. You you can't let that. You can't let that kill your drive to be a great workplace. Mm. Like, I know. That, I mean, I'm saying that because I know people who feel the, the word I hear is betrayed. Yeah. Or an employee that leaves you is not is not betraying you. No. <laughs> but you give them every reason not to where yeah. where they don't want to do that. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, those those are some of the, you know, dem- demotivators and motivators. Um, and that's, you know, what a best place to work is. But we've talked about this a little bit. But again, why is it worth it to build this best place to work? Imagine that you went to work. And somebody came up to you and said, we had a problem on the Johnson job. The plumbing was all in wrong and they poured concrete over it. And uh, the guys were out there, but we took care of it. We got that saw cut, we got the plumbing fixed, but I just thought you ought to know we had a problem. Instead of coming up and saying, oh my God, you better get your butt over to the Johnson job because <laughs> it's a disaster. Yeah, I mean, literally, I think... I know because I just got off a conversation today with people who accept far less than actual engaged help. Engaged help who actively seeks solutions and helps you. It's a force multiplier to you as the owner. There's only so much you can do. And if they truly um, are engaged and want to help you, it makes the kind of place where you really want to come to work yeah. and they want to come to work. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, it's, it goes back to what Branson said. A, a second subject is, if your employees are engaged and happy, your customers will know that. Yep. And who do they want to show up on their property to do a job, whether it's commercial or residential? They want people who act like they're professionals, act like they want to be there, not moping around, yep. leaving a mess, because they care. Yep. And that's a pricing issue. You can charge more when everybody likes you. Absolutely. Right? Happier customers with happier employees, right. but also you're going to be happier. You're going to have less stress. Right. You're going to have more time. You're going to have more money. That's why this matters. Um, you're also going to just have better work in general. Right. Right. The work is going to be done right, just like you said with the Johnson job. Even if there is a mistake, it's going to get fixed. Mm-hmm. Um, I think some practical things, uh, you know, Turnover is really costly. I mean, yep. having to find new employees is really hard. And typically what happens is turnover is a vicious cycle. Like if you're having employees in the door and out the door constantly, you're you're having to spend so much time just finding someone to do the work that you're not able to actually find the right people to do the work. And the learning curve when they do show up, yep. they don't even know where the keys to the truck are. It's, it's just constant and it never gives you time to take a break from hiring to focus on putting in better systems right. 
to building a better workplace to right you know all these different things so it's costly in so many ways and if you can have really good employees that are happy uh, you're gonna be able to build a better business so um, I think happy people are also contagious that's something to remember hundred percent like and it's easy to spot people that aren't happy in a yeah group so of happy are people. unhappy people yeah ha- unhappy people are just as contagious and so if you're able to have you know a majority of your workplace really happy and someone's not you're able to see hey is this a personal issue that I can help with that you know they're struggling with the situation or hey this actually just isn't a good fit this is you know um, what's the the term not negative Nancy maybe that's it um, there's the SNL skit man what's SNL stand for Saturday Night Live. Oh, that's right. Chevy Chase. Wah, I haven't wah. seen it since. I haven't seen it since Chevy Chase. Was Debbie there. Downer. Debbie there Downer. Is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Debbie Downer. This is Debbie Downer. We need to to get rid of him right. or her, or whatever it is. Um, and it's hard to be stressed around happy people. That kind of brings up a, a point too that when you have somebody who is Debbie Downer as a part of your team, you need to get rid of. Yeah, and that kind of goes on to the next point. Like, how do you build that best place to work? And, you know, one of the big points here is fire the bad fits. Right. Right. And I know you, you mentioned hesitation earlier. Why do people hesitate to fire those people? The, well, my personal experience and what I see with other companies, I hear these words. I haven't given them a chance. I, this, that's what I hear the most often. Mm. What I hear next is, well, I haven't trained them well enough. And those are the two, th- sometimes there's some obvious things. They're stealing from you. They never show up for work, some of those things. Those are easy. But it's when you have good people, and I hear things like, well, they have a family. I hate to put them through that stress. And it is. That, those are the hard ones. Somebody who doesn't show up, steals from you, is dangerous. That's easy. Just see you later. But the good people who, who are not contributing they're hard, they're hard to fire. And I think it's generally, there'll be some listeners out there who don't care. Hell, I'll fire his ass. <laughs> but most people I work with aren't like that. They right. really think this is a person and I'm telling them that they're not good enough to work here. It's, it's almost like it's the same mentality whenever someone sees sales coming in but isn't looking at the margins. Right. And like, I, can't, I need that job. Right. Because it's got cash flow. But it's killing but it their business. Yeah, well, it's using all their capacity and not making any money. Yeah, and once you show them the margins and what the outcome is, they're like, "Oh gosh, right. like I, I guess I have to fire that client or that project." Well, it is. I don't think there's any way to make it easy except to decide. Everybody has a place in the world, and what I say is, your place isn't here. <laughs> but you, you also, if you put it off for ninety days, you're delaying for ninety days you're getting the right person yeah and you're delaying for 90 days they're finding the right fit yep absolutely and it's it it is hard but you also have the responsibility to your company and to the people who are still working in your company absolutely and i read a great quote somewhere and i can't remember where but it said there's no faster way to ruin a good employee than by tolerating a bad one yep kind of goes back to that that it all pays the same mm-hmm. well you say you want excellence but this guy or this gal does jerk work and nothing happens. Yep. And so they, I mean, they're just myriad reasons that they affect everything. And that is one of the hardest things as a boss, as an owner, and you have to do it. And the sooner the better, jerk the bandaid off. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, we've mentioned some of these other things that you are required to build that best workplace. You've got to have your vision, uh, obviously. You've got to be intentional about your culture. You've got to keep a pulse on the right. people, right? Hey, are, are we living out our values? Does this person really fit? And you don't do that by just going through work as normal. It, it can happen, but your mindset's not in that place. Well, we have a podcast on culture, don't we? I, we sure do. Okay, good. Yeah, company culture and why it matters. Uh, right, and, and the thing about a culture is a culture is a set of similar values. If you have a lot of people who are honest and care about people, uh, they get along together. If you put in there a snake who's only out for him or herself and they're not above stealing, you rate what you skate, whatever you can get away with, it's not going to work over the long haul. And uh, whenever two or more people get together, there is a culture, period, especially if three or more. There is a culture. 
the question is, did it happen to you or did you create it? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of contractors are not driving around consciously thinking about their culture. They're driving around constantly experiencing their culture, <laughs> but maybe they're not thinking about it. And that's why, and I think it's in the show notes of that uh, episode, we have a culture statement where you mm -hmm. think about what matters to you, what's important to you. It's a little more than that. It's not just saying words that you put on a poster on the wall. It's a little more than that. But if you have to know what's valuable to you and what you want in your company, then you begin to acquire employees, coworkers who have similar values. Yep. There's that old saying that we hire for skill and fire for attitude. Attitude's another way to say your values, how mm -hmm. they fit with your values. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to spot. We hire for skills because it's easy to test if you can drive a skid loader. Yeah. It's not so easy to test. Will you show up every day? Will you take care? Will you take shifts for an employee who has a hard time? Mm -hmm. Are you engaged? Will you stay a little late to get that job finished today so that we can go to the next job tomorrow? Or are you out of here at five? Uh, do you, ha you have to look for that. So yeah. you have to hire people with intent. Absolutely. And I think what's really important to to how you can keep that pulse on things. It's it's not just a, a matter of hiring for values, right? But managing for values, right? You know, good point. You it's not just enough to say okay they fit the values it's going to work. You've got to keep a pulse on it. You have team meetings as a group, and yeah, maybe it's going to be with a really big purpose to talk about this job, to talk about what's going on in the office or whatever it is. Might but be a barbecue too. With exactly. Chris. Have some Chris. of those team meetings where you're just being people, <laughs> right? Being humans. That's really important where you can really see those values shine. Um, and then I think I mentioned this earlier: quarterly reviews. Like, do it. Don't make it too hard on yourself. But quarterly reviews and train your managers to do quarterly reviews as well. But literally, like, you're not hiring for skills. Skills matter, but you're not hiring for skills. You're hiring for values. You shouldn't review only on skills. You also review on values. Just to give you an example, for my quarterly reviews that I do with my employees, I have them rate themselves and I rate them as well on a scale of one to four on all of these areas. You know, one being I have we haven't seen enough in this category, let's make a plan to fix it. Four being we're more than impressed by the, your performance in this category. You need to be teaching the book the course on it. You know, you need to write the book on this category. And those categories are our values. Hey, what was your attitude like? Right? What was your commu communication like? Your, how was your growth this past quarter? Were you dependable? How's your dependability? How was your productivity? How was your initiative? Did you take a lot of initiative? Did you innovate things? How was, you know, did you bring some new ideas to the table? You know, all these different values that we have. How was your collaboration with teammates? Those are all things that we're having them review themselves on and we're also giving them feedback on ourselves. We're celebrating the times where they were doing a really great job of exhibiting our values. And then we're also saying, hey, I, I, here's a situation where I didn't see you have this value. What was going on here? And that's keeping a pulse on things. And then when you catch people doing right things. Catch them in public. Catch them in public. Let yeah. them know. Praise in public, reprimand in private, right? right. And so uh, I think that's one of the biggest things you can do to build a best workplace with your values is just keep a, a good pulse on things. Um, you know, another things I'm really trying to help our team, uh, understand the value of mistakes. We have a team meeting every Friday and I, the first thing we talk about after we say, how is everybody doing? What mistakes did you make this week? Because if we're making mistakes, it means that we're going, putting ourselves out on a limb, you You're know, doing the giraffe, they're doing the draft, putting our neck out there. And it means that we're trying new things. It also means that we're learning. It's the best way to learn is not by picking up a book. It's not by going to college. It's by getting your hands dirty, making mistakes, and experiencing me. I things. wasted. You did waste your Damn. money on your MBA. You wouldn't, wouldn't believe how much <laughs> I've wasted on reading books the last couple no, of years. Books are important. <laughs> no, I'm but kidding. You're always going to have better retention on yeah, an actual Yeah, you remember mistake. it better when oh, you yeah. actually burn yourself rather than reading about how badly a burn hurts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, th I think little other things, you know, don't settle and hire a heartbeat just because you, you think that's the best thing. I, you know, we went through a hard season with our company uh, where we were getting a lot of work, but we didn't have uh, the right hires lined up in the queue. And we had to go find those people 
we just made two new hires and they're I think they're great fits but during that time I didn't want to just hire a heartbeat and I had to have a conversation with my team hey guys we're going to be in a little bit of a push through season here where we're over capacity we're working really hard and it, it doesn't seem like there's an end but we will be hiring and we've got it's going to be about three months probably before that person's trained and ready to go and honestly it was it's probably really more realistic between four and five months just with all the training and everything but people understood and they also feel that they help contribute to building exactly which you haven't had completely no, done not, it yet we're not completely but there's purpose and when you get to the other side you're the old veterans you know exactly exactly so, i remember when there were just two of us <laughs> we did all that work ourselves exactly um i think something that we haven't talked about is investing in the good fits mm -hmm. you know really show that you care not just about the professional yes give them professional development and certifications and trainings and conferences all those things celebrate them in public right but have personal conversations with them know what's going on with their family and how you can support them in that and in, in their you know endeavor to be a good family um, know what they really care about and get them good gifts and not just hey here's a gift card but something that you know really has meaning to them um, it, it really goes a long way to feel like you're known by somebody and that you're heard by somebody and in a, in a lot of ways that's what we all strive for is that we want to be known we want to be heard and so if you're able to you know operate on a personal level with everybody it really does go a long way so we've talked about a, what it is to be a best place to work how you do it why it matters um, we gave a pretty good framework of the mastery the purpose what am i missing and the autonomy, autonomy. Um, let's go into some of our favorite segments uh, I don't have sounds today, so I think we've a boom. I think we've kind of retired the sounds, maybe. Well, we have. We've we've uh, we've gone on so our, we're so in depth with our topics <laughs> that we've had to displace the sounds, the the fluff. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump into Mount Rushmore. Okay. Martin's favorite. He always dreads it when we start coming up with these, but eventually he starts liking it. Well, I like it after. There's a guy who said he didn't like to write, but he loved having written. <laughs> that's kind of how it is. I don't like to think of these, but when I have them, oh, that's pretty good. I enjoy it. So it's right. just because it's work. It is work. You don't like to do the work. You have to think. It's uncomfortable. You have to think. That is truly uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, so uh, for this Mount Rushmore segment, we're covering company cultures um, and best places to work, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we're probably overlapping some of the same places we mentioned in the company culture and why it matters episode but that's okay so i'll give mine my first one okay. we each have two for I'm the four change mine so i don't overlap i forgot all about that that's all right but. okay go ahead so i'll give mine first chick-fil-a i'm pretty sure we mentioned that in company culture but it's obvious that the two are so com so uh, intertwined that if you have a good company culture you probably have a best place to work as well um and chick-fil-a i think does an incredible job of that like they are in an industry that is so difficult. I don't know if any, if any of you guys have ever worked in a restaurant. It is hard work. It's service. It's manufacturing. It's every, it's everything. <laughs> and it's fast paced, especially fast food. And man, they, they have a smile on their face. They've got their systems down. It's a, it's a machine. It's working. And people really love working there. Um, and they really invest in their employees. So it, it's obvious that it's the best place to work just by how you interact as a, right. as a customer with their employees. You can tell that they're enjoying their work, uh, especially it's compared to... an example of how happy employees take care of customers mm -hmm. and customers love it. Absolutely. I mean, just compare them to any other fast food restaurant and it's, it's remarkable. So, um, yeah, what's your first one? My first one is U.S. Bank, giant behemoth mortgage lender. Um, I have a some dealings with them and I had an issue and it was very important and they didn't have to make a correction. So I totally dreaded calling a number, an 800 number. Your mm -hmm. call was very important, press one. Mm -hmm. was, anyway, I went through all that, very nervous, got a person online and they went beyond reasonable. 
to correct my problem, take the first steps. I wound up having to talk to him about six times and I got different people every time and every time they went above and beyond mm. to take care of my problem, which got resolved. But the point there is that one of your worst nightmares is the idea of dialing into somebody who controls your fate and it's this giant bureaucracy and you're just touching numbers on a dial pad. We all know what that's like. And that's not what happens. So I'm giving a shout out to U.S. Bank because I'm a huge fan and if they get some business because I said this, I'm, I'll be a happy camper. Yeah. You know, my, my next one, my last one is, is similar um, and it's our cell phone service provider, uh, T-Mobile. And, you know, recently we've got new employees. We've had to buy some new devices um, and had to exchange some. And I've had, basically, long story short, I've had to call probably 10 times in the past two weeks. And every time I speak to somebody on the phone, they are very competent. They can find, they're not having just, oh, let me get a manager. And I've never heard that they, once. They've got a giraffe of the month award. They can make a decision, huh? <laughs> Seriously. And they, they're figuring things out something that I really loved and this is more of a systems and processes is like they I they have this you know process where you call there's a wait in line do you want to call back yeah press one cool they call you back it'll be at about an hour I got a call back and I was in a meeting and I answered I said man I'm so sorry I I'm in a meeting right now can you guys give me a call back yeah absolutely what time four o'clock awesome I'll call you at four yeah he called me at four and something else they do they let their employees send a personal text that is to their line where I can and I and I thought oh this is just a okay you know it's it's got their signature with their name on it but that's about it I've gotten a text from all 10 of those different people that I've talked to and every single one has been different and on two of them I've texted back a couple times and they have a conversation with me and it's that level of autonomy that they're giving to those people to actually right. have a relationship with the customers that they're dealing with I mean, it's not easy to work in a call center. That's another, like fast food's not easy. Working in a call center can feel like that, you know, manufacturing job that's just, okay, here's the part, put it on, where you just answer the call, deal with the problem. But they do an excellent job of giving their, their supporter, uh, customer support autonomy, and they, you can tell they actually enjoy their job. So kudos to T-Mobile. Yep. Well, we've had all big ones so far. I'm gonna go uh, small here. Uh, my wife has a company. She's a speech pathologist. You're she, sucking up already. What's that? You're sucking up I, already. I am, but she, she doesn't <laughs> listen to my podcast. <laughs> She's not going to listen to us. Actually, she will. But she has a culture in her company. She has uh, 17 employees. And she guards, she makes it look effortless because it's who she is, because she won't tolerate the wrong kind of, uh, mm. of culture. But she has a culture of, therapists who all love each other, respect each other, keep each other's backs. And when she does get the occasional misfit in, it's she doesn't just run them off immediately, but they don't last very long. Yeah. And she protects that and it is conscious and we talk about it. Mm. Uh, not because I'm telling her what to do, but it's on her mind. And it's had, I, I don't have permission to give a lot of results, but it's had outstanding results. And she had uh, therapists that are hard to hire. I mean, it's a competitive market for yeah. working for less than top market rate because of the culture and mm. the environment they worked in. Now, she's brought them back up to market, but when she was building, they sacrificed to work yeah. there, and they did it because they loved it so much. That's great. That's great. Well, um, you've already given our quote of the day, Martin. Oh, I didn't say it right. You can say it right. Oh, don't worry about your customer. Actually, I'm, I'm jumping the gun that. here. What's our George Washington of those four? Oh, I know what mine is. <laughs> yeah, the Holland Pediatrics Dude, probably. damn right. <laughs> I'll go with it. It's a small okay. business. It's more relatable to what contractors are dealing yeah. with. I mean, and she just did it. Yeah. She made it happen. That's great. I love that. Um, so... Quote of the day, uh, we already mentioned it from Richard Branson, but don't worry about your customers. Take care of your people, and they'll gladly take care of your customers. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about that many times, and it's just, it's true. Um, before we go on to something we can actually do, you were mentioning, you know, Holland Pediatrics and your wife, and it just made me think, like, 
how much of this I, I don't have any kids and you've got three kids three. Um, how much of this conversation is applicable to family life where oh no I'm the boss <laughs> wait no you can't wait fire. Diane's the boss yeah, exactly. and I just do what she says you can't it's fire simple. your kids right yeah or you I mean I guess you could but you're probably not likely to uh, but is it? is it similar it's the same thing I mean kids you're a little more bound to them you stick with them I'm not gonna fire my just what you said I'm not yeah. gonna fire my kids but it's the same thing you want your children to have autonomy mastery and purpose yeah and you want to help them do that and then if you take care of everything for them, if you do everything for them, if you correct their mistakes, answer their que- or answer questions for them. Yep. Not answer their question, but answer questions for them. They don't learn and grow. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's the same thing. Your employees are not your children, but they are other people, and you really come to love them. Yep. I mean, if they've been there for a while, you've been through some of the battles with them, yep. and you're sitting around drinking a beer saying, you remember that time that mm-hmm. such and such? Man, there's that camaraderie. I was never in the military, but that's what I imagine of the guys who've been to combat together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the reality is, and it, and you know, it's not always true, but a lot of contractors are probably spending more time with their employees than they are with their family. Oh. And so you need to be just as diligent. I don't even think there's a probably to that. I mean, just yeah. looking at the hours. If you I don't mean, well, you got sleep. family businesses and right. Those oh, that's things. true. Yeah. But um, I mean. You've got to be just as intentional as you want to be with your kids and with your, your spouse, with your employees, because it matters. So anyways, something you can actually go do. Let's wrap this up. Um, our, our one thing today that you can go do is take a pulse of your team. And you know you can do that through team meetings. You can do that through quarterly reviews. However you want to do that in the ways that we've mentioned, take a pulse right now. And one thing that we suggest, if you're up to it, is to give out a survey and see what they really think about your workplace. And we've got that survey in the show notes so that you can, uh, it's actually a Google form. You can download it if you want to, or you can just make a copy of it and there'll be a video that describes how to actually do that. And then you can send it out to your employees. Yeah, it can uh, be anonymous. Well, and you can make yeah, it anonymous. Yeah. Um, you don't have to require their email or, or anything like that. give their rankings of whether or not there's too much politics here, whether or not they're clear expectations. Yep. No, and it's really interesting to get that feedback yeah absolutely so yeah take a pulse of your team go get that survey from the show notes send it out to uh your employees and see what they really think so um yeah we appreciate it uh appreciate you guys listening hope that it's been helpful if there's something that we missed that you feel like applies to this topic we'd love to hear from you um and yeah anything else martin you got that's it all right well appreciate it We will uh, see you guys soon. Hope that you're finding less stress, more time, and more money in your business and in your life. See you guys. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Cashflow Contractor. Check out our website in the show notes or visit thecashflowcontractor.com.